Well, thanks so much for coming. Um, we're, we have a lot of slides to cover, so I'll just try to zoom by all the different uh, items here. But um, we're gonna be talking about elbow injuries. Uh, just a little background of who I am. My name is James Lee. I'm a physical therapist in Chicago. I, I've given a couple of these workshops at, uh, with BKB and thought it would be good to talk about elbow and wrist issues. Uh, I have my own practice in Chicago for the past uh, almost four years now and been a physical therapist for about 10 years and very fortunate enough to be able to do climbing and um, help people with climbing injuries. So uh, very blessed. So thanks for coming. I wish I could hear your different elbow injuries. Uh, typically I give this presentation in front of a big group and um, unfortunately we won't be able to do that, but that's okay. So a little question here for you guys. How many muscles do you guys think uh, cross the elbow joint? Any, any guesses there? This would actually be, let's see. Yeah, I can't see the chat group, so no worries. Okay, so we'll just, here's a little hint uh, to uh, all the different muscles that are crossing the elbow joint, right? It's pretty crazy. You know, before, when I was, when I wasn't a physical therapist, I thought that the elbow, you know, it just flexes and straightens out and maybe the biceps and triceps, two muscles, but there are actually 16 different muscles that cross the elbow joint. So a lot of different, um, different connections there. And it's pretty crazy if you think about it. You know, that's what I thought was what crossed the elbow joint before my PT days. And now it's, it's all of these guys here, right? The entire page. So names are not super important, but it's just, you know, mind blowing to know that there are all those muscles that cross. So of those muscles crossing the elbow joint, can you guys guess how many also cross the wrist? So if there were 16 muscles, um, how many cross the wrist? So we take out these guys and there are, bam, nine muscles that also cross the wrist joint. So incredible right we we don't really think too much about that but when you you're climbing and you're having to grab different holds like depending on whether it's a pinch or a crimp or slopers a lot of these muscles are involved so we'll talk a little bit about them so that's a picture of your forearm from the front and the back and these are the muscles that cross the wrist joint right so um, don't really have to go into detail about all of them, but we're going to be talking about different ways that you diagnose some injuries, right? So for, in general, there's, you could get an x-ray, which shows whether there's a fracture or you can even see the dislocation. So in the picture of the x-ray, you see that this is the lecranon and the humerus. They're not connected to each other. So you know that there's a dislocation there. Or there's a CT scan that goes into more details of what could potentially be going on. And then you got your MRI, which uh, also reveals a lot more tissue, soft tissue injuries, right? So you see this little highlighted section right here and, and with contrast, sometimes there are um, ways to show if there's um, injury uh, to the actual tendon, right? And then finally, you can also see uh, a clinician, some specialist that has seen hundreds, if not thousands of uh, elbow problems, right? So whether it's an orthopedic surgeon that specializes in a certain area of the body, or someone like me that uh, specializes in rehab of climbing injuries, right? A lot of times without even having to get any imaging done, you can pretty easily diagnose like what's going on just by experience. So I wanna talk a little bit about pain science, understanding uh, pain itself, right? Because a lot of times, 
you know, how many of us are climbing? I obviously right now, not as much, but before COVID happened, while you were climbing, uh, how many of you guys had little aches and pains in the wrist or the elbow and you were still able to climb, right? So what's going on there? A lot of times we tend to think that if we're experiencing pain, that your body has undergone some type of tissue damage, right? But it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that, right? Um, we don't have dedicated pain receptors in our bodies. We have something called nociceptors, and they're seen more as a danger signaling, right? So your body will go through so many different sensations throughout the day, and sometimes your brain will interpret some type of sensation as uh, it'll it'll switch from that natural sensation of like a stretch per se, right? And it, so for whatever reason, there's a trigger that causes that same exact sensation to feel like something's really painful. And that's a really good mechanism typically when your body will go through, um, it's, it's healthy, right? So you know that you should stay away from certain activity if it's causing pain. But a lot of times, um, there's no such thing as pain receptors. A lot of times, when something becomes more chronic, uh, meaning it could last for a month, two months, um, medically, they say chronic issues tend to happen if it's more than three months or more, right? So when things become more chronic, that's when there's a little bit of this uh, physiological change that happens where your brain becomes hypersensitive to a specific sensation and they interpret it as pain. And now you're going through this like fear avoidance behavior, right? If, if this certain activity caused pain, then you're going to stop because you don't want to experience that pain. And so uh, when things become chronic, you become very hypersensitive to a certain activity and that can cause greater pain if you just start to you know try to um, move that certain part right low back pain for example is a huge issue in the united states and just all over the world right and that's that's another reason why low back pain is so hard to treat is because um, it's not necessarily tissue damage that happens, but it's a physiological change. So here are two different stories, right? How are these two different people able to cope with a certain sensation that they experience and they feel pain? So narrative one, person tried to climb this slopey route and their elbow started to hurt a lot afterwards, so uh, they're not going to do it anymore, right? And then narrative two, the person tries that slopey route, same exact route, and experiences the same exact pain. And they realize, man, this is too hard for me. I think I'm gonna try to maybe lessen the difficulty and keep training, right? And eventually that person is able to send the route, the same exact route without the pain, right? So what's the difference between these two this narrative one the person has this more biomedical understanding of pain thinking that if that hurts then that's going to cause me damage so i need to stop doing that activity so there's a higher perceived harmfulness of physical activity they're they're afraid right whereas the other person now nowadays there's this idea called the biopsychosocial right where there's just a, um, that pain itself may not necessarily be causing tissue jam damage, but maybe my body's just not able to tolerate that activity yet. And so I'm going to train it and build it up. And so there's a lesser perceived harmfulness of physical activity than they keep on doing it and bam, they're, they're able to do the climb, right? So 
pain doesn't always equate to tissue damage. And that's something very important for you guys to understand, for all of us to understand. We'll talk about a couple different elbow injuries and I'm, I'm gonna lastly talk about a, a wrist injury uh, moving forward here. So elbow, tennis elbow, right? Before they used to call it lateral epicondylitis. You know, that is still possible, but itis is a very short term acute stage, right? So typically, are, are you, if you guys have this type of pain in your elbow, has it only lasted just a couple of days? No, it, it actually lasts, can go up to several months or into years, right? Depending on where you are in your climbing levels, right? Uh, so there are six different muscles that attach to the lateral epicondyle. And here, let's see. Oh yeah, there you go. Um, this is the, where the red arrow shows is where the lateral epicondyle is. And if you guys can see the video, you know, from your hand on uh, myself, that's this bone right here, right? So closer towards the thumb side, right around that area, the lateral epicondyle. And you got a lot of different muscles that are attached to that, right? And the lateral epicondyle, it's, you have finger extension, right? Whatever opens the fingers up, as well as wrist extension. A lot of those muscles will insert into the lateral epicondyle. Here's just another picture. So I have different case studies of, um, for each of these elbow issues. So this person is a 39 year old who uh, presents with this pain on the outside of their elbow, right? And they've only been climbing less than a year and they climb one to two times. So the, a very beginner level climber, right? And they start to experience this pain on the outside of their elbow, uh, some aggravating factors, like what makes it hurt? Group pinch grip hurts. Uh, gripping water bottles hurts. They wake up a lot in the morning with a lot of pain, right? And they're able to climb uh, easily V2s. They work on V3s and they project to V4s, right? So what's going on there? Um, so this person, oh, this is actually a, a study that was done Normally, when we think of grip strength, right, we, we tend to think that there's a lot of importance of the, the forearm like in the finger flexor. So hopefully you guys can see my, my video as well. But when I'm clenching my hand, right, we tend to think that more importantly, it's building up the strength in your forearms on the palmer side. But the, what this study has shown, as well as just you know, a lot of research has come to show when you make a strong grip, not only is it important to have these guys, your flexors contract, it's actually very important to have wrist extension strength as well. So uh, when someone's climbing, bam, you grab these pinch or grab whatever. And not only are your finger flexors working, but the wrist extension, there's naturally a 35, 30 degree wrist extension that locks in your grip. So wrist extension is absolutely crucial for that strength. Um, okay, so some exercises that I had this person do was naturally when, you know, I'm, I'm sure you guys have seen a lot of people grab a dumbbell and they do that wrist curls, wrist extension back and forth like this. But even with your hand fully closed, there's, a lot of involvement of the finger extensors that help with wrist extension. So in order for you to minimize the use of those finger extensors, you want to grab something in a wider pinch position. So this yoga block, or you could grab a Nalgene bottle and some weighted, some decent amount of weight to help build up the strength, right? Of those wrist extensors. So I had this person do, these specific exercises um, for four weeks and doing it just twice a week. And what ended up happening? Feeling so much better, right? 80% uh, back to normal four weeks later. No more pain uh, upon waking up. And still has some pain with picking up 
you know, more weight, heavier weights, but he's back to climbing and he's on the right track. So who would have thought that that wrist extension would have really helped to build, to reduce the amount of pain that you're feeling there. Okay, now there's golfer's elbow. Um, actually, yeah, you know, I really wish I'd be able to see. Okay, actually, I have some, I have a chat group. So feel free, guys. I have the chat group available that I can, I can see here. I hope uh, if you guys have any questions, I'll, I'll be browsing the chat group back and forth. So feel free to ask any questions and, and I'll try to go back and forth between my slides and the chat group here. Um, and I'll, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Okay, so golfer's elbow. We got medial epicondylitis. Back in the day, this used to be called that, but we call it epicondylalgia or epicondylopathy. And this is more on the inside of your elbow here, right? And there are five different muscles that attach to the medial epicondyle. And all those muscles work on flexing the wrist. So your finger flexors, as well as your wrist flexors, all those guys travel here and insert right into this common flexor tendon and that inserts into the medial epicondyle. There's a bone there. Here's another picture, medial epicondyle. So there's case study number two. This person is a 36 year old presents with the same pain on the inside of their elbow uh, for six months, right? And they've been climbing for a lot longer than our case study number one. So 13 years of climbing. And they're a pretty strong climber. They're um, flashing V6, sending V8s, and projecting V9s. But they end up having this tenderness to the inside of their elbow and aggravating factors, pinch grip, right? The same thing similar to the case study number one, but slopers are also uh, painful as well as compression moves. So what's going on there? Um, once again, this is more of a muscular issue, right? Um, you know, hopefully you guys can see my video here, but I'll try to describe it. But when you close your fingers like this, open and close, um, you can typically when people are climbing right the finger flexors are a lot stronger just naturally that's obvious but why is it sometimes that slopers like grabbing opening up your hand and holding those like slopey positions or compression moves like when you're squeezing something really hard and trying to progress past that why are those a lot harder right it's because you have two, two different muscle groups. So you got the finger flexors are one group, but you also, if you negate those finger flexors, you have these wrist flexors. So wrist flexion is very different from finger flexion, but you know, if you're grabbing a dumbbell once again, and you're holding that wrist, uh, the dumbbell, and you're holding it in this position, you're doing these wrist curls what is happening there you're very strong in this position because your finger flexors are very strong but the moment you open up your hand and you try to do those same exact wrist curls it's going to be a lot harder because you're negating the finger flexors from assisting and you get purely those wrist flexors so there's two main wrist flexors one's flexor carpi radialis and then you got the flexor carpi ulnaris and that ends up um, a lot of times you know you, those get neglected because we tend to think that fingers are all that matter right a question here so from nikki is there an easy way to tell soreness from exercising the elbow and pain uh, to help determine whether the strength in your exercise is working so yeah, that's something that you're going to have to play around with. How does, how do you, how can you tell the difference between soreness and pain? So that's once again, this understanding of like pain, like, is it actually causing 
damage or is that pain just a result of that muscle not being strong enough to be able to tolerate that that level of stress so uh, when i tell my patients to try to work through certain types of pains and this is assuming that it's a muscular issue or even a tendon issue that you want to work within a level of four out of 10 pain. So it's okay to experience the pain when you're doing these exercises. Once again, assuming that it is a muscular uh, or a tendon issue, then definitely okay to work within that minimal level of pain. So if out of a 10, zero to 10, 10 being excruciating, zeros, no pain at all, it's typically okay to work within that zero to four range of pain and you want to work through that and as you keep doing that then your your body's going to tolerate that stress and it's going to be able to incrementally take more and more loads right and that takes time good question though okay so going back to this um so there's a difference between th finger flexion and wrist flexion and so I had this person do these certain exercises that are going to be focusing a lot more on wrist flexion and going pretty heavy here, as well as stretching. So this person was very strong. And the picture in the bottom right, you see, you know, sometimes when people are, when I just test out general range of motion, like people have a really hard time even just getting to 90 degrees here. And so if you're like stuck here and you feel a lot of tension there, like sometimes stretching would be beneficial for you. Okay, so what happened to this person? Four weeks later, uh, minimal tenderness to those same spots on the inside of their elbow. Still has occasional aches and pains, but a lot less with slow burst, pinch grip, and compression moves. So feeling much better just by isolating and building up the strength to the wrist flexors and not just focusing on finger flexion. All right, last one for the elbow related issues. We got some bicep strains. So what's going on here? Oh, from Phil, thanks for asking. What are your thoughts on muscle voodoo flossing for tennis golfers elbow? Uh, I think it, so there's a lot of treatments out there that are going to um, help relieve your symptoms temporarily, right? So there, um, yeah, it's, I don't, I don't know if I wanna go too far into this. For example, right, um, let's say you have a neck problem and you're, you're trying to, you get a massage to alleviate that is that gonna actually help to resolve the issue in the long term, right? No, not necessarily, because the neck, you know, you, you, maybe you gotta build up the upper traps, you gotta build up some levator, you gotta work on your posture, you know, a lot of different things. So in that same way, I think voodoo flossing, um, there is some validity in terms of, um, oh, what do they call it? Um, blood flow restriction. So in that sense, I think there may be some uh, validity to voodoo flossing if, if you're working on that blood flow restriction. Um, but the, the science behind it is, has not been that great. You know, I think there are some benefits to it. So we'll, we'll just stick to that for now, but thanks for asking. Okay, so with the biceps, elbow flexion, right? Back in the day, I used to think that elbow flexion was only done by the bicep muscle, right? Uh, but we got three primary elbow flexors, which are the biceps brachii, brachialis, brachialis, radialis. And then you have, you actually have secondary elbow flexors, which are these tiny, smaller muscles here. I'll we'll take a picture or take a look at the, uh, these images here. So the picture all the way onto the left, you got your biceps, which cross the elbow joint as well as crossing the shoulder joint here, right? Underneath that, if we take that out, we got the brachialis. And then we got here, closer to the forearm, towards the forearm is the brachioradialis. 
uh, pronatoteres, flexor, carpi radialis, and extensor carpi radialis right here. So the question is, gripping overhung versus underclinging. What is the difference? So there are, you're using different muscles when you're grabbing overhung routes versus doing an undercling. Well, overhung routes use a lot of the secondary muscles uh, closer towards your forearms. So these are muscles that not only cross your elbow joint, but they also cross your wrist joint as well. Versus undercling motions, you know, you are using these other muscles for sure, but primarily you're, you're using a lot more of the biceps. So when someone has a strain, for example, case study number three, this person thought that they had um, biceps strain, right? But this person, 22 years old, climbing overhung routes, uh, before routes. So they haven't really been climbing for too long, but they're climbing a lot. And you know, how many of us know someone or were just as much at fault of just climbing excessively, right? This person climbs three, four times a week and they just started to climb. And now they're starting to feel like this bicep strain, strain in their elbow. Um, no tenderness, however, to the biceps. Um, but aggravating factors are juggy overhung routes. So what's going on? It's not a bicep strain, what is it? This was more of a brachialis issue here. So if you remember the picture before, underneath the biceps, there's a muscle called the brachialis and it only crosses the elbow joint, whereas the bicep crosses both the shoulder and elbow joint. So I had them, this person do certain exercises that are going to bias the brachialis to start building up some strength to the brachialis, right? Uh, some reverse preacher curls where your palms are face down and you're doing those curls. That's gonna really work on the, um, the secondary elbow flexors as well as the brachialis. Um, similar exercises here. A lot of these exercises overlap. But afterwards, within four weeks, um, less frequency. And I also told them to like take more rest. Like you shouldn't climb that hard all the time. And then after four weeks, it helped to minimize the pain with overhung routes. No, no more deep, deep achy bicep sensation after a climbing, uh, climbing session. So there is a difference between a biceps injury versus a brachialis problem, right? So brachialis is, a, is, the, is the issue. Uh, any other questions here? Let me see. Okay, no, no questions for now. Okay, so lastly, I'm going to talk about TFCC um, issues. This, uh, on your wrist, closer towards the ulnar side, you have this thick fibrocartilage that naturally, you know, when you fall, it helps to absorb shock. Um, and it, it's a really helpful cartilage there. And actually, if you can see here, the this is a muscle, we'll come back to this, but the extensor carpi ulnaris muscle um, or tendon of that muscle crosses into the TFCC region, right? So we'll, we'll come back to that. But why is this an issue? So if you take a look, this was actually, you know, I just found this picture on Mountain Project. This person, you know, was climbing and they felt a lot of wrist pain. And if you take a look at the, the wrist on the left, there's not as much of this bulge, but on that right side, man, what's going on? This is, it looks really swollen there, right? Prominent ulnar head. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to that. So. Remember, there are six different muscles that attach to the lateral epicondyle, but we want to focus on these three particular muscles. One is called, um, name's not so important. So if you take a look at the video, as you extend the wrist here, pure wrist extension, um, they're controlled by these three muscles. You have two muscles that are 
going towards the thumb side. So that's why you can see the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis. But then you also have the, on the other side, extensor carpi ulnaris muscle here. And let's see you guys try this. So although I won't, we won't be able to see you guys, I want you to just look, make a fist with both hands and just turn your wrist up like this, right? And which picture does your wrist look more like? Does it look more like the one on the left where your wrist is sort of cocking towards the thumb side? Or are you more evenly balanced and you also see a crease on the pinky side there? A lot of times what ends up happening is because you have two main muscles, extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis connected here towards the thumb side, and you only have that single muscle extensor carpi ulnaris on the pinky side, for whatever reason that tends to dominate and you have this dysfunctional movement pattern of wrist extension, radial deviation there, right? And those get worked, um, not too much, but they, they dominate, right? As opposed to the ulnaris. So this person ended up doing, these exercises look very similar, but with the focus of extending your wrist and deviating a little bit more towards the ulnar side, so that you're engaging not only the radial muscles, but the muscles that are closer towards your pinky or the ulnar side there. And, and the more you can build that up, I had a, this person working on doing these similar exercises and within a matter of a month, like that, that pain ends up going away. So the reason why you see this bulge happening is because the ulnaris muscle that crosses that TFCC region becomes weak and these carpal bones end up dropping a little bit. And so it, it looks, you know, there definitely could be some swelling involved as well, but the, the greater issue is because there's a lack of this muscle, the extensors on the ulnar side, that over a chronic period of time, that can cause the carp carpal bones to drop, right? And then there's a more of a prominent ulnar head. So the more you can build up the strength to that extensor carpi ulnaris, right? That's gonna help to reduce the amount of stress to your TFCC, right? And so any questions about that? And I know that's a little confusing, but no questions yet. Okay. Um, so I, I wrote a blog, Climber's Elbow, um, Guide to Self-Management for Elbow Pain. If you just search that, you can also, there's a little bit more detail of what's going on there. Um, oh, that's it. So thank you so much. I, you know, I'll leave a couple minutes here if anyone has any questions you guys can either hit the space bar and just shout out say you have a question or you can also write any uh, questions in the chat group thank you so much for coming kelly si saima <laughs> nikki uh, max has a question are there any exercises you'd recommend generally for preventing injuries um, that's a that's a loaded question because like uh, what what exercise so for wrist and elbow I I think one of the best exercises is doing these preacher curls. Um, I'll go back to the picture of this guy here. So preacher curls uh, gets the bang for your buck, right? Because you're working on these secondary elbow flexors, and so if you look at my video here, you know. I'm doing these preacher curls here. That's the same exact motion as I'm grabbing something and I'm trying to pull myself in, right? A lot of that is gonna help to build up some of that strength. And these aches and pains that people feel, whether you're beginning to climb or you've been climbing for a long time, a lot of the case is with certain muscles that just need to develop a little bit more. And we, we tend to climb 
too hard, too fast all the time, and it causes a flare up in those muscles. So doing this sim simple preacher curl exercise even three times a week for like 10, 20 reps, three sets, three times a week uh, for six to eight weeks. And that's gonna really help to minimize some of these pains that I've seen a lot of people have. Uh, question. Okay, from Ruby, how do you determine the difference between overuse versus weakness? Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. How do I know the difference between overuse and weakness? So overuse versus weakness. I think they sort of go hand in hand, honestly, because when you're climbing hard or just doing anything in general, um, you're, there's the weakest link that ends up, you know, getting injured or stressed, right? And so, you know, I see this a lot in runners where their soleus is weak or their hip flexors are weak and those end up getting strained, um, even their gluteus media. So it, overuse, like you, if you guys are athletic and a lot of the athletic population, and I'm sure that's all of you, you're good at compensating for certain weaknesses. And over time, if you keep doing a certain repetitive motion, those weak muscles are gonna get um, accentuated. So I think they sort of go hand in hand. Uh, from Hannah, what was the exercise in the bottom right of the wrist exercise slide? Let me see. Hopefully I can see, understand which one you're talking about. Um, hopefully you're talking about this one, Hannah, with the bicep, the, the dumbbell. Yes, okay, good. Um, this one, it, you know, I think this one typically is called the hammer curl, where you're, you're not fully supinated, you're not fully pronated, but you're just um, midway point, and you're just curling that back and forth. Typically, I think it's called the hammer curl. Uh, but that one is going to help to isolate more of the um, brachioradialis muscle. So hammer curl, brachioradialis. Dustin says, were the exercises in the photos mostly isometric or eccentric? Good question. Um, you can do either. So back in the day in the PT world, they were just, you know, really stressing eccentric exercises helps to build up tendon strength but your tendons don't know the difference between eccentric isometric or concentric so um, yeah most of these exercises i like to hold especially at the end range for just like five seconds and then release and go back and forth like that so with the pinch grip with the yoga block i do like a five second hold and then release five second hold and then if it was more of an ulnar like emphasis you want to hold it there and then shift a little bit towards the pinky side hold it there for five seconds you're going to find doing 10 reps is going to be very challenging um question from Anne earlier on you characterized one of the case studies as climbing too much at three to four times a week how is how much is appropriate yeah good question uh, for for beginners, I would say two, three times a week. Um, if you're climbing five, ten plus years, I, it it really varies. You know, it really depends on um, how strong you're climbing, and you can actually. So a lot of people climb every day, but they also vary the the intensity of their climbing, right? And um, yeah, I know a lot of people that climb every day and there, there are times when I would even climb like five times a week. And so it really varies. And for people that are starting to climb, I would say in general, you want to have this principle of 80% easy climb and 20% hard stuff. You know, the principle applies to like runners. So people that are training uh, with like Olympic athletes, you know, high-end athlete uh, runners, majority of their, their running is done at a conversation pace. 
meaning that you're able to run and carry on a conversation with the person next to you. And that's the majority of their training, right? And so in that same sense, if you're climbing at a level where you're not like straining your body all the time, then a lot of these injuries will become a lot less. But it's, we're so wanting to like try that hard move or, you know, we're with a bunch of friends and we, we want to do what they're trying to do. And it's just, um, it's a bad recipe for injuries, right? So, so I hope I answered your question, but it's a little complicated. So three, four times could be a lot. Maybe it's not, you know, you can climb every day as long as you're very up your intensity of climbing, right? Um, yeah. So thanks for asking. Good question. Okay. That seems to be all the questions. Uh, that's going to be helpful when we come out of hibernation. Yeah, exactly. Hibernation. You know, I am itching to get back to climbing as well. So I hope this was helpful. And I hope, you know, a lot of times people think that full rest is going to get us back to climbing in good shape, but you may potentially injure these same issues. So uh, try to learn a little bit of, I hope you t took away something from this and you know, when you, those injuries come back or those aches and pains come back, try to just build it up and build up the strength and don't be, don't push it too hard. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. I will stop sharing my screen here and have a good one. I'll see you guys around. Thank you.